Good afternoon. We're convening the Senate Committee on Transportation on our 3 p.m. agenda here in Senate Conference from 224, as well as over Zoom. Uh, we do have a number of measures up on our agenda today. Uh, we do have two agendas, actually three agendas, including a joint agenda with the uh, Government Operations Committee. So we'll just note for the folks who are signed up to testify and in the audience that um, members are running back and forth between competing hearings. So we may take um, pauses and recesses as appropriate to make sure that we have the opportunity to get everybody's voice heard in the committee, but also make sure that we're able to vote. So that being said, um, we are asking folks who are here to testify before us today uh, to make sure your written testimony is submitted. And barring that, um, we'll ask you to summarize that testimony in person to make sure that we have time to get through every testifier. So that said, up first on today's agenda is HB 1619 HD2 relating to peer-to-peer -peer car sharing insurance requirements, which establishes peer-to-peer -peer car sharing insurance requirements and makes other uh, statutory changes. And testifying first this afternoon on 1619 is the Department of Transportation. Good afternoon. Yeah, top of the afternoon to, to you, Chair. Uh, Chair Lee, uh, <laughs> well played, sir, well played. Vice Chair uh, Inoue and honorable members of the Transportation Committee, uh, Jay Butai for DOT. Uh, we stand on our submitted written testimony in support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next is DCCA. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chair. Uh, my name is Colin Ayashida. I'm the Insurance Commissioner for the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. The department stands on its written com comments uh, for this bill. Specifically, uh, we respectfully request uh, the amendment to ensure that insurance coverage requirements under section 431 colon 10 C-B are primary to any personal motor vehicle coverage. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Chair will be available for, for comments. Thank you very much. Up next on 1619 is the American Property and Casualty Insurance Association. Aloha Chair, Annie Makapagal on behalf of the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. We'll, we'll simply stand on our written testimony in support of this important measure and make ourselves available for any questions, should there be any. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. <clears throat> Up next is the Hawaii Insurers Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Allison Uyoka, Hawaii Insurance Council. We strongly support this bill. Similar to the insurance commissioner's comments, we're asking for amendments to ensure that the peer-to-peer -peer coverage is primary over all other coverages. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next is Geico in support and Turo. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, Chair, was that for, for uh, Turo or Geico? Uh, uh, Turo. Okay, sorry, Chair. Go um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Chair Lee, members of the committee. Uh, Tammy Bowie on behalf of Turo. Um, I'd like to focus just, uh, Chair, on three areas of the insurance requirements today. The first is the language related to admitted carrier. And I just wanna make super clear that we completely agree with the desire to use an insurance carrier that falls under direct oversight of the state um, and that our proposed amendments reflect the same language that was discussed and agreed upon last year. Um, the second point is a requirement related to optional coverages. And I also wanna make super clear that uh, we are not in opposition to the desire to provide optional coverages. Um, the concern is mechanically being able to fulfill this requirement as written. Um, and so um, uh, because there's reference to a shared car driver being able to elect or reject coverage, um, it is actually the platform that is the named insured on the policy. And so this very issue arose in the TNC statute and there was language there that reconciled this issue. And so what we're proposing simply uh, takes the same approach in order for us to mechanically fulfill this requirement. Um, and now I'd like to speak to the $1 million coverage requirement. Um, this bill currently has language with insurance 
coverage similar to TNCs at 1 million. Um, but with Turo, we would never have the scenario of a for hire driver driving a passenger in the driver's car. With Turo, a guest books a car and then drives themselves, and so the risk is entirely different. Um, so we need to look at analogous circumstances. So if I walk into a rental car company for a car and I borrow, or I borrow one from a local friend, there's no requirement in those cases for higher than state minimums. Uh, so the question is, why would there be a $1 million requirement for someone who chooses to book a car on a peer-to-peer -peer platform? Um, to date, there has not been evidence um, to show that using a car on a peer-to-peer -peer platform is any less safe than a rental car or a personal car used in any state. Um, and there's just no factual or policy basis for the assumption that using a car on a peer-to-peer -peer platform is of greater risk. I'm almost done, Chair. I, I know I'm past the two minute. I'm, I'm almost done, so I, will, I promise I will wrap it up. Um, I, I uh, just wanted to make sure to clarify that there just has not been any sort of factual or policy basis for the assumption that driving a car on a peer-to-peer -peer platform is of greater risk than driving a rental car or a car from a Hawaii car owner who has allowed a family member or friend to use it. Um, that said, we have heard loud and clear a desire to have more coverage. And so the language we are proposing before you is a compromise solution that essentially codifies Turo's current offerings. And the language says very clearly the program would be required to assume all liabilities of a car owner up to 750,000. And at the same time, the program is required to provide the driver with no less than the state minimum in liability coverage. And this makes sure that all parties are insured and that there are no gaps in coverage. So for example, if a driver is driving- Can I just ask you to wrap up and we can- Well, sure. Okay, I, I, I will wrap up. Yeah. So, if a, so if a driver chair is driving to Ala Moana Mall, something happens, say the brakes give out or it causes an accident and it's found that the car owner is liable, in that case, the 750,000 kicks in. If instead, say the driver is doing something that makes the driver liable for the accident, say they were texting or not paying attention, whatever that may be, the state minimums kick in just like if they were driving in their own car or driving a rental car. So we truly hope this language um, shows our shared willingness to establish uh, the uh, appropriate insurance requirements for this industry. And I'd like to just uh, thank you and uh, am available for any questions. Thank you for making time. Thank you. Up next is uh, Hawaii Association for Justice. Hello, Chair Lee, Vice Chair Inouye, members of the committee. Evan Oye on behalf of Hawaii Association for Justice. We stand on a written testimony in support of this measure as it mandates the required minimum of insurance coverage for car sharing and peer-to-peer -peer platforms to be no less than a million. Uh, we look forward to working with insurance stakeholders and peer-to-peer -peer industry on this issue. Mahalo for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And lastly, uh, get around in opposition. Uh, that's all the testimony we have on this measure. Are there any questions? Um, briefly, uh, if the insurance commissioner is still with us. I am. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, just based on your uh, testimony earlier, you said the primary issue that you had raised um, for your purposes was contained in just the quick uh, amendments to, I believe it was page seven, lines eight through something. Correct. Uh, Correct. Just dealing with um, clarification over primary insurance coverage and so forth. Is that right? Correct. And then, um, thank you. Thank you very much. And for uh, Hawaii Insurers Council. Yes, Chair. Thanks. Um, essentially, your testimony was basically to the same effect, right? Clarifying where primary coverage uh, plays first. Yes, Chair. All right. And from your perspective, the insurance commissioners, have you, have you seen the insurance commissioners uh, proposed language in their testimony? Yes, I think his language is also fine. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Turo, if you're still with us. Spui. Yes, Chair. Hi, thanks. Um, to that point, uh, you guys have raised, well, a number of things, but Sticking with the first portion of your testimony, or sorry, the first point that you raised in your testimony. Um, let's see. 
Oh, just regarding uh, admitted carriers. Um, yeah. You know, there are obviously some of this discussion overlaps with the Consumer Protection Committee to which this bill would go next. Um, so not to dive in too deep, but well, actually, let me just start. Sorry, take one step back. For the uh, discussion we just had with the insurance commissioner and HIC, are you guys also um, okay with that clarification that they're making, which seems mostly technical on its surface? Um, I'm so sorry, Chair. I guess I, I want to be very specific about what your question is there um, to, to answer it. So uh, I'm sorry. So the insurance commissioner, um, as well as Way Insurance Council, had proposed um, similar language that would address um, uh, what, which primary insurance coverage, or sorry, which insurance coverage would be primary and uh, kick in first, should there be some sort of um, disbursement, essentially a layer of responsibility. You know, why don't we, why don't we follow up on this um, after the fact, because it does get a little bit technical and we're not all looking at the same language here. Sure. Um, but then moving on just real quick to um, was it the second it? point in your testimony you, yes. you about the $1 million of coverage. Yes. What you guys have proposed was what you're currently offering in other markets. Is that right? It essentially codifies what we are offering in all of our markets at Turo. Yes, if that's your okay. question. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, any further questions? All right, we did just get a note um, that one of the folks who wished to testify on this uh, did make it into the Zoom meeting. I guess they had some trouble. So why don't we go ahead and go back and return to um, get around. If you'd like to testify in this measure. Yes, thank you. I'm so sorry for that. I had an issue with the link. Um, Aloha, Chair Lee and honorable members of the Senate Committee on Transportation. Uh, mahalo for the opportunity um, to comment on House Bill 1619. Uh, my name is Soledad Royball and I am a public policy manager with Get Around. And I hope that this testimony will help provide additional perspective of the peer-to-peer -peer companies um, and, and you know that we are currently operating Hawaii and are eager to continue to provide Kama'aina with safe, affordable and reliable transportation options as well as an opportunity to earn extra income. Get Around is fully digital and contactless. We are a digital car sharing marketplace that very recently started to operate there. And our company uses patented technology to connect safe, convenient, and affordable cars with people who need them by the hour to live, work, and we allow guests to book a wide variety of vehicles directly from the app without ever having to meet anyone in person to carry any access card or to wait in line or coordinate to pick up keys. So nationally, we cater to a large number of users who don't have a car, often because of the incredibly burdensome cost associated with owning a vehicle, especially for working families that live in places that are incredibly expensive, like Hawaii, which is 88% higher than the national average in terms of cost of living. A couple additional points that I think need to be understood on this bill and considered are that peer-to-peer -peer car sharing is very different from the TNC model of Uber and Lyft. And under that TNC model, riders enter a car being driven by a stranger and they go to an unknown location. The driver may or may not know where they're going. In contrast, get around guests begin a trip by locating the car, unlocking it, it's unoccupied, it's a parked car. and they go to where they want to go. And also to date, there has been no evidence that peer-to-peer -peer car sharing is any riskier than someone utilizing a rental car or any car, and not 10 times riskier if that, um, which is basically what this bill is calling for insurance for. So further, um, you know, we've testified that we have significant concerns with this bill. And we recognize there needs to be a framework for peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, and we're very supportive of that. But the way the bill is written, it's untenable for us to continue to operate in Hawaii. And you know, some of the issues that Tammy also mentioned, uh, failure to uh, expressly exempt shared car owners and car sharing platforms from vicarious liability, which is consistent with the federal Graves Amendment, 
creating an unworkable and inconsistent framework through the definition of car sharing termination time, which would extend the platform's insurance obligation well beyond the contracted trip. And that was a concern that was actually resolved in SB 2444. But it also would prohibit surplus lines of insurers from providing the required coverage, which in tandem with the extraordinary high limits of this bill suggests could severely limit, if not eliminate the ability for platforms like ours to obtain coverage that would enable us to be economically viable there. I can so ask you we, to summarize. And we wanna help make Kama Aina lives better. Um, and I know I'm over time, but uh, we really hope that we can be part of finding solutions that will work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I, that was all the testifiers that we had. Uh, we did have a couple of questions we had got into. Are there any further questions on this measure or for this testifier? All right, if not, thank you everybody. Why don't we move on to the next measure on the agenda, House Bill 2218, HD1 relating to the Frank T. Okimoto Reef Runway, uh, which designates the reef runway as the Frank T. Okimoto Reef Runway. And we have testimony in support from three individuals. I believe that's all the testimony we have. Uh, seeing as there's no one here to ask questions of, why don't we then move on to the next measure, HB 1953 HD2 relating to concessions, which provides the Department of Transportation with more flexibility and discretion to address substantial hardships. And testifying first on this measure is the Department of Transportation. Aloha Chair, uh, we, stand on, we stand on our submitted written testimony in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is the Airlines Committee of Hawaii. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Lori Lum on behalf of the Airlines Committee of Hawaii testifying in opposition to this bill. Um, as stated previously, um, we do believe the bill is unnecessary as the department has already, they have the discretion um, to address substantial financial hardship situations. And they have in fact um, waived minimal annual guarantees resulting in over $120 million of relief to date to the concessionaires since the pandemic, plus they've extended contracts. Um, further, we believe that legislating the ability of one party to a valid contract to reduce their financial commitment is inequitable and it could create revenue uncertainty, which bond ratings could view as a risk. Um, so as this bill creates unfair subsidy by transferring financial risk to the airlines, we respectively ask the committee um, to hold this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Up next is the Airport Concessionaires Committee. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Wendell Brooks here. May I go first? Um, Thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak in favor of uh, House Bill 1953. Uh, I'll try to be brief if I have two points. The uh, most important, uh, number one, is that in time of crisis, the DOT needs to have broad discretion and flexibility to help concessionaires remain open to service the, the uh, traveling public just like other uh, landlords and uh, commercial landlords do. Uh, commercial landlords don't have the restrictions as interpreted by the, the uh, attorney general as relates to our uh, state laws. Other airports on the mainland have this uh, broad, uh, broader flexibility that uh, House Bill 1953 uh, uh, provides. As far as uh, item number two, uh, uh, House Bill 1953 corrects the unfairness that occurred. Uh, some tenants during this last period of, of, with the COVID did get substantial uh, extensions. Others got less and some got none at all, which is seems to us to be just uh, patently unfair. The law needs to clearly state that the uh, DOT has flexible powers. DOT's argument really does, to, does not make sense to us in, uh, in the light of the Attorney General's opinion, which actually restricted what the DOT could grant. And we ask that you uh, consider that. Uh, 
thank you for the opportunity to present and uh, we'll be available for questions. Thank you very much. Up next is uh, Mr. Stone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Honorable Committee members. Jim Stone here on behalf of the Airports Concessionaires Committee. We tried to pass this bill last year, uh, pointing out that contract provisions and Hawaii's restrictive laws would prevent fair relief to concessions during times of hardships. Uh, other airports have the flexibility and discretion. However, the bill did not pass. Um, it's very uh, disappointing that the airlines and the airports are making the same arguments that discretion exists uh, and fairness exists because it simply does not. Uh, we have a lot of problems and as pointed out, which is not denied, the airlines say extensions have been granted. But as you know, the extensions were unfairly granted. Some got extensions, some got less and some got absolutely nothing. And those that got absolutely nothing was because they were performing under a verbal agreement. And the reason why they were performing under a verbal agreement is because the DOT could not get the contracts out on time. So why are they being punished with no extension because the airport couldn't get the contract out on time? The, the arguments are, are so ridiculous uh, and this bill is no threat because the airport can say no to any and all requests for relief. They say that 102 grants relief, existing 102 is only for construction projects. This bill amends 102 to expand it to significant events. They talk about giving $125 million well, that is what Congress intended. Congress gave direct 50 billion, I repeat, 50 billion to the airlines industry. Congress expected the airports to allocate money Congress gave to the airports, which is far less, and also to use some of the airports funds and flexibilities to help concessions. Why help concessions? Concessions have to stay open to service passengers. So, the airport had to balance the fact that Congress gave 50 billion to the airlines and how do we keep concessions open? And that's what Congress expected the airports to do because concessions have to stay open to service passengers. So it's no surprise. And clearly we didn't get 50 billion worth of support like the airlines did. And, you know, they talk about this and that well, the bill says everything is discretionary. And if anybody asks you for anything, you can simply say no. So how is this bill so harmful? And so can I ask you, you to know, summarize? Well, you know, we have uh, proposed amendments uh, that are important. The airlines talk about uh, their um, uh, relief if they have to pay. Well, if in balancing the airport says the airlines got to pay more, that's fine. But let me, let me educate you. The airlines also got $76 million of the airport fund in the past. They were asked not to reduce the seat capacity to Hawaii, but they took the $76 million out of airport surplus concessions funds and they reduced the seat capacity of Hawaii. They raised all kind of baggage fees and handling fees. They also opposed the PFC charge that would uh, provide millions and millions of dollars to the airport over the years. And the airlines oppose that. The airlines oppose this bill because they want to leave the airport with no flexibility to help concessions, meaning it's more money for the airlines. And that's why the airlines are opposing this bill. Stone, don't, let the you, legislature, you don't let the legislature be blamed for having fairness continue to exist. Please pass this bill, which is not a threat. Thank you. Okay, up next on 1953. Uh, that is all the testifiers we have on 1953. Okay, uh, any questions? Senator DeCoy. Um, Stephanie, oh, hey, um, Ross, can you explain what the airports has done for concessions 
during this pandemic in terms of financial relief or any financial relief, please? Sure. Um, so the DLT used this, and I, I say the word discretion, and I repeat the word discretion, uh, to financially support the uh, airport concessionaires in two ways. Number one, uh, based on the language specified in all con concession lease agreements, the airport's division exercised a lease provision relating to relief due to e economic emergency. So in general, it allowed the DOTA to modify the terms of the concession agreement at the DOT's sole discretion. Therefore, effective April 1st, 2020, uh, we allowed concessions to pay the airport's division a percentage of gross receipts rather than the minimum rent guarantee for its respective concession lease agreements. Um, this allowed them to open its doors uh, earlier to the traveling public um, rather than later if it had to pay uh, minimum rent guarantees. Uh, the accumulated amount of the waiver um, just received from my financial department from April 1st, 2020 to date is nearly $125 million. Uh, number two, the second way that we provided financial relief uh, due to the downturn from, the, from both domestic and international passenger traffic caused by the pandemic, the airport's division offered up to two years of extension to all concession lease agreements. Uh, the reason for this is to allow concessions to recoup losses from disruption from April 1st to March 31st, 2022. Um, I know Mr. Stone mentioned in, in prior um, hearings that Deputy Higashi wanted to offer two years across the board to all concessions. Um, however, I'd like to have my Attorney General's office, who um, should be um, here virtually, uh, to provide more information on this matter. So either Linda or Margie, would you be able to also comment? Hi, good afternoon, Senators. Um, so in the, in the leases, a uh, standard provision in their concession leases is that they could be provided um, relief um, to offset to, for them to be able to amortize their initial um, investment um, in their, uh, in the concession um, when there is, you know, situations like the pandemic. And, you know, it was determined by DOT that a two-year extension, you know, would cover probably the, the period of economic downturn during the pandemic. However, when we looked at it, we noticed that there were some leases where they might have had 10 years to go, in which case a two-year extension made sense. However, in situations where they only had a year left on their lease or six months on their lease, that it wouldn't be fair to the other tenants if they were also given a two-year extension because then it would more than compensate them for any amount of amortization they needed to recapture um, on the remaining term of their lease. And so it was determined that they should be given extensions to be uh, to run to the, the end of their lease or two years, whichever was shorter. And that was so that it would be fair to all of the lessees, not only the ones with shorter leases, but the ones with the longer leases, that they would all get it in a um, prorated manner. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Any further questions on uh, 1953? Um, got a few. Um, we can go back to, I guess, real quick to DOT. So I guess following up on, on some of that, the issue at hand for your part over the last couple of years has been trying to provide relief for concessions broadly. And what you're saying is the circumstances of each concession is different depending on its own circumstances, where it's at in its lease and so forth. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so uh, let me go to Mr. Stone. Um, so following up on that, the bill you have before us, or the language before us, applies pretty broadly to uh, pretty much anything that 
that would exist within the DOT system. Is there intent on your part to specifically provide, um, I think what, what you're calling your testimony, fair um, relief for everybody or is it really targeted at those who might not have got more than others? Okay, the, um, the purpose of the bill is to give the DOT the powers that other, and, and discretion that other airports have, which is total flexibility. And uh, they can consider any request for relief, it's total flexibility, and they would, the DOT then at each and other airport, which we would want for Hawaii, to look at the circumstances and to give some or absolutely nothing. We want to give the airport total flexibility like other airports now and in the future. The problem, as the AG has mentioned, Hawaii has restricted laws and restricted contract provisions. And these restricted laws and restricted contract provisions prevent the DOT to granting flexibility. The, the deputy wanted, he told all of us in a video Zoom, he's going to give two years to all concessions across the board, like other airports. Other airports gave three years. And the reason they gave it is because of the loss of volume of business. The AG is hanging their hat on the amount of time you need to amortize your investment. That is the restriction under the laws. That is the restriction under the contract. And this bill seems to remove those restrictions because other airports don't have those restrictions. The point that has been totally missed here is that the loss of sales, the loss of gross receipts, that, and that's why other airports gave three, two years, three years across the board, whether you had no contracts, verbal contracts, they gave everybody fair relief across the board. And that did not happen here. Unfairness occurred. And I can't blame the AG because Stone, they're Mr. interpreting Mr. Stone. The laws. Thank you. I think what I was getting at is, you know, you had suggested that obviously some people in your perspective were treated or some concessionaires were treated uh, one way, others were treated a different way based on restrictions in the law that currently exist that prohibit the same kind of relief from being provided to all. Is that right? Um, I mean, that that is part of it. There are other parts of the law that um, allow for fairness. For example, uh, the current law limits it to 15 years. We have construction prices running 30 years. So there are other things that are, are in the flexibility of the bill to give the DOT the power to be fair to the businesses. And so we have an attractive business environment at the airport. And um, so there's a variety of things. It's like, uh, it's like a list. But the point is, it's what other airports have even with the airlines that other airports have, other airports have this, and we want our airport to have it. And it's no threat because the airport can say no to any request for relief. Sure. It's no let me, threat. Let me, let, me, Mr. let me just stop you and, and just wrap this up because I know there are other folks who have questions. So um, when you talked about, there's a bunch of stuff on the list that, that are contained within the bill, things that could be uh, uh, provided to DOT, different tools and whatnot. Um, but in your testimony, you're sort of targeting or you seem to focus on those who have not got relief where others have. So in the scope of what's in the bill is really is the intent here really to try and make whole in your perspective, those um, folks who did not get what was already provided to others. No. Or are you really trying to look more no, broadly at just I mean, across the board empowerment? So, I mean, I mean, I mean, there's other things. We have what they call DBEs, Federal Disadvantaged Business Enterprises. And those disadvantaged business enterprises, they want to be able to continue on their contract if the prime contractor refuses to accept the extension. And the prime contractor here, one of them refused to accept a two-year extension. So these small businesses want to have the opportunity to fulfill their small business locations for the two years. This bill gives the airport the flexibility to do so. The airport okay. said the airport okay. said that they would consider yeah. it. Mr. Stone, let me, let me stop you there um, and move to Senator Inouye. Yeah. Um, then um, the question is, uh, Russ, it seems like 
the, the complaint is the concessionaire is the same two year extension up, across the board. So can, can you explain why you provided then the, all the custom, concessionaires to two years? So I, I believe A.G. Chow did explain, but I'll explain. Okay, sorry, yeah. because I, no, no, I no, just no. came I, in I, from another. Means, I would love to explain. So okay. the start date for this was April 1st, 2020. And I'm just going to give you an example. If there was a lease that ended March 31st, 2021, that is exactly one year. That is the period of disruption. And that is what the A.G. is, is, is saying that these, if a business had a disruption period of one year, the lease would have ended on March 31st, 2021 anyway. So that being the case, we'll only give one year of extension, not two years. Why should you get two years when your lease would have ended in one year anyway? So that is the situation why nobody got two years across the board. Not, okay. not nobody, but not everybody, not all concessions. Okay, and what I hear, uh, Jim, um, as well, you're talking about the concessionaires, um, and it seems like we haven't had testimonies from um, others like uh, the rental cars, uh, the parking concessions with regards to this measure. So I, I'm kind of curious because it seems like the testimonies were pretty limited. Um, to those. So what about the, con uh, the concessions uh, as the parking, uh, the rental car operations? How do they feel? Well, because we uh, haven't heard from them and I was curious. Okay, let me answer. Um, we have a, a broad concession group. All of the people you mentioned are part of our group. Uh, they know our testimony. They are speaking. The rental cars, Senator, are not part of our group. They have their own um, uh, lobbyist group. Our group stands behind our testimony. Our group is very disappointed and quite honestly, some of them are fearful of retribution. They're fearful of coming forward and, and testifying when they feel that the airport has not been up front. You know, I, I'm not going to listen to that kind of um, indication because I think here we have other issues and I think I'm sure our colleagues have other questions. Thank you. Well, Thank there, you. there's Thank always you. fearful of landlord retribution, Senator. Okay. Are there other questions? If not, let me, um, Mr. Stone, just one last one on this point. If at the end of the day, whatever bill passes into law and DOT has discretion to do whatever um, might be appropriate, if those existing concessions that have not yet got the amount of, same amount of relief from your perspective as many of the others are given that relief and that is it. Is that sufficient for your purposes? You know, Senator, COVID has made this whole airport environment totally unpredictable. We want the airport to have the flexibility, discretion and powers like other airports so they can be fair to businesses as unpredictable circumstances arise. And therefore, that's what this bill does. At the same time, this bill doesn't mandate anything. And for any reason, the airport can Mr. say Mr. no, Stone. it's not a threat. Mr. Stone, let me stop you. I think, let's assume for a minute the bill passes, DOT has all the discretion in the world, but it is still their discretion. If the only outcome and end goal or end result here is that those limited concessions that have not had the same relief as all the others are made whole, and given the same relief that everybody else got, is that a sufficient end goal? No, because as I mentioned, there are other issues. We have the DBE issue. We have a contract in Hilo Kona where construction prices have gone over 30% with supply chain problems. The, 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 the concessionaire, because of that jump in prices, cannot complete the project. Because so the it's, DOD beyond, it's beyond just COVID years. is what you're saying. Pardon me? Your, your, your goal is beyond COVID is what you're saying. Well, some of those issues arise out of COVID. I mean, all of the flexibilities and the laws that other airports already have, they're not only tied to COVID, they're tied to events that create disruption and hardship. Okay, I, and we're I understand. trying to do the same. I understand. Thank you. And then lastly, um, uh, Ross, just following up on that, 
if we put something like this into law, which gives discretion to you to do, um, you know, other things, I guess what triggers would you be looking at to actually exercise that? And, and really what is the real life outcome at the end of the day here? So the bottom line is the word sudden event. It has to be triggered by a pandemic like what we just faced. There's a trigger in, in the bill that simply says, if, you, if your gross receipts go down by 15%, they can come to the DOT and they can ask us, can we get financial relief? Five years, 10 down, years down the road, I'm not gonna, I may not be here, gonna be dealing with the, the property managers that are the younger guys. And then the question then becomes, it's gonna say here, it says in the bill, if it drops by 15%, we can ask you for financial relief. Well, what if it's due to the type of product that you sell? What if it's due to the workforce of the sales team that's at the airport? What if it's due to the pricing? We're not going to give, I wouldn't give a uh, financial free for that. That's based on how the, uh, the business operates. So that is why we already have the discretion. I believe this bill is unnecessary. We've already demonstrated by, by using our sole discretion to provide the two things that I mentioned before. One was to give an extension up to two years for most concessions. And like I said earlier, they only had to pay a percentage of gross receipts. They didn't have to pay the minimum rent guarantee. I believe the DLT was very fair in what we did over the last two years. Thank you. Can you, can you tell us then how much was the loss? We provided $125 million in financial relief. And this was not due to anything to do with the stimulus. We came out with this. We were one of the first in the nation to offer this package. Other concessions or other airports that I work with called me to ask me what we were doing. And so this is what they did. They followed with percentage only. Thank you. So, so Ross, if you... If you stuck with the original and not give it discretion, how many of those concessions was would have still been here? It probably none of them would be around. They'll probably be all out of business right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Sure. Any further questions? No. All right, if not, um, I know we've been on this particular measure for some time. Uh, I'm sure there's gonna be plenty follow-up afterward, but in the meantime, we do have a joint hearing with the Government Operations Committee that we will need to switch over to. Um, we'll also have two other measures on this agenda that we will return to uh, following that. So, okay. Okay, why don't we burn through the rest of the uh, measures on this agenda and we'll come back to okay. our GVO hearing, which is our 315 agenda. So for the moment, uh, thank you everyone. Let's move on to SCR 55 and SR 50, requesting the Department of Transportation to convene a task force to study a feasibility to conduct a feasibility study on alternate emergency access routes and a second bridge to serve the Hanale, Waipa, and Haena communities. And testifying first on SCR 55 and SR 50, which we will take together as uh, one, is the Department of Transportation. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, we stand on our testimony in support of the intent, uh, but we, uh, we do not uh, support uh, convening a task force to conduct a feasibility study. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Mike Tahilig with the managing director, or excuse me, who is the managing director for the County of Kauai. Uh, with comments. Um, up next is the Historic Kauai Foundation in opposition, um, one individual in support. And also, Huiho uh, Omalu Ikaaina in opposition. Hanale Tuhaena Community Association uh, in opposition. Kauai Taro Growers Association in support. Um, and we have uh, Michael Ching in support, uh, Karen Diamond in opposition, and Hermina Marita. Good afternoon. 
Aloha, Chair and uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'll, I'll stand on my written testimony. I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, I think many of the testimony just refer to SR 50, but they should apply to both the concurrent resolution as well as the re resolution. And um, after reading through all of the testimony, I think there's consensus that um, an alter alternate route be discussed, but there is concern about including discussion on a second bridge. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that's all the testimony we have on SCR 55 and SR 50. Uh, that being the case, are there any questions? If not, um, Ms. Marita, uh, thank you for your testimony. I, just to be clear uh, for the record, um, if we were to amend this resolution, deleting the reference to a second bridge, but really focusing on the core, I think, intent of the issue, which was an emergency um, access route, is that something you're suggesting that uh, might be a good way to go? Yeah, I, I, I think that was the uh, subject. The second bridge was the um, concern and uh, um, opposition to uh, both resolutions. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, thank okay, any, you. Any further questions? Uh, yes, Chair. Go so, ahead. Chair. Um, yeah, good to see you, um, Mina. Uh, so you, is the opposition uh, the same with regards to the Hu'i Ho'ovalo i Ka'aina and the Hanale Haena Community Association, their opposition? Was it basically, as the chair mentioned, it could be um, the second bridge? Is that it? Yes. Uh, it, it appears that Hui Ho'omalu just wanted to kill the resolutions, but okay. the Hyena, um, Hanole Hyena Community Association was amenable to amending the resolution to drop any reference to a second bridge. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And, you know, we appreciate that we visited, you know, the area and, and that yeah. particular group has really done a super job and we thank them for all they do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further questions on these measures? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to SCR 73 and SR 66, requesting the United States government excuse me, United States Department of Transportation to conduct an investigation regarding the safety of the bridges along Hana Highway and testifying first is the Department of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we stand on our testimony in support of the intent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I believe that's all the testimony we have. Um, are there any questions on this measure? If not. Okay, yeah. um, that is the end of our 3 p.m. agenda. So why don't we go ahead and um, we're, what we're going to do just for folks who are uh, watching, we do have our 3.15 p.m. Uh, joint agenda with the Government Operations Committee. I think. Okay, so why don't we then um, Clear up. Yep. Clear recess, agenda. Yeah, recess for decision making here on our 3 p.m. Unless this is them walking in the door right now. That's okay. It is not. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll recess for decision making uh, on our 3 p.m. agenda. Good afternoon. We're reconvening our committee on transportation for decision making on our 3 p.m. agenda here in Senate Conference Room 224. Up first is HB 1619 HD2 relating to peer to peer car sharing insurance requirements. Uh, recognition is to move this measure forward. We'd like to make some amendments. So the first one is going to be adopting the recommendations of the insurance commissioner, clarifying um, some language to address uh, their and Hawaii Insurance Council's concerns over primary coverage uh, in Section 2, pages excuse me, section two, page seven. Um, and that's with reference to uh, 431.10c-103.5, as well as making some of the technical fixes that they recommended. Um, 
I'll note uh, just for the record that there are other um, more insurance heavy recommendations as well as uh, <coughs> the recommendations from Turo and others, um, which uh, will leave to the Consumer Protection Committee since that is purely an insurance uh, related jurisdiction. Um, but otherwise we'll move this forward and I'll just note it does have a defective date on it. So um, this will go on to consumer protection and ways and means and they can uh, figure out the rest of that. So any questions or comments no. on this? If not, Vice Chair. Okay. Chair's recommendation on HB 1619, House Draft 2 with amendments. Uh, Chair, please. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Uh, Senator Decoy. Aye. Senator Shimabukuro. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Measures adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Moving on to HB 2218, HD 1, relating to the Frank T. Okimoto Reef Runway, which will designate the reef runway uh, as the Frank T. Okimoto Reef Runway. Um, seeing all testimony and support, I'd like to recommend moving this on as is. Any discussion? If not, Vice Chair. Okay. Thank you. Chair's recommendation <coughs> to pass HB 2218, House Draft 1, unamended, with five members present. Any with reservations? Any no votes? Your measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Next is HB 1953 HD2 relating to concessions, which provides DOT with uh, discretion to address substantial hardship. Um, I'll note there's a lot of discussion on this and thank you to all our testifiers for engaging in that. Uh, what we wanna do is defer this till Tuesday, uh, 322 at the end of our agenda. Um, and we'll chat with our stakeholders and uh, committee members between now and then. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I yes, please. offer? Um, you know, as busy as we all are um, as well, and this is not, I, I can't see how um, it's going to be satisfied to all, but we all have to remember that there's management that occurs at all airports. And we have to make sure that if we're not satisfied with the management, um, then something drastic has to happen. If the, personally, if DOT airports did not make any adjustments to assist the concessionaires, I can say, you know what, they haven't done much. But giving up a hundred and how many um, million dollars that we already lost, um, I, I just feel that a deferment is not going to do anything with regards to this issue. So. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but I, I think we should do a roll call. Any other discussion? Yeah, Chair. Um, I, I feel the same way as uh, um, it's just they did, and um, we 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 was pretty much uh, pretty much harping on that adjustment, and um, <clears throat> I could see if they didn't do it, like Senator Inouye said. And there would be another uh, alternative. Um, regardless, if we divert, defer it today, my, my vote will still be no um, going forward. Thank you, Chair. Understood. Chair, uh -huh. Sorry, to quit. Sorry, Chair. Um, you know, I feel the same. We had a lot of discussion on this. I think um, that airports did their due diligence on the management, that the Attorney General also gave their opinion of making sure that that airports management was in alignment. Um, and the last question asked was what would have happened if there was no help whatsoever? And, you know, pandemic has hit everybody hard, I get it, but I think airports have done their due diligence and, you know, I would, with all due respect, I would have to go no on the bill. My apologies. Understood. Any other discussion on this? So um, we'll pick this up on Tuesday. Uh, and we know, know where everybody's I, at. I'm sorry. I, I think we're already going against the deferment, Mr. Chair. And there's a portion where it says, I, I'm calling for a roll call vote for a hold on this measure. Is there a vote on defer? No, I, let me take a quick recess. Recess. Okay, thank you, everybody. We're back uh, here in Senate Room 224. We're in decision making on our 3 p.m. agenda. Um, so, just for clarification, for HB 1953 HD2 relating to concessions, 
Um, as I mentioned, we'll be deferring that to uh, Tuesday, the 22nd on our 3.05 p.m. agenda. And then finally, uh, moving on to our resolutions, SCR 55, SR 50, requesting DOT to convene a task force to conduct a feasibility study on alternate emergency access routes and a second bridge to serve the Hanalei and Hyena communities. We'd like to move this forward, making some amendments, um, adopting the recommendations from the testifiers uh, to remove references to a second bridge, uh, adding the Hanalei Community Association as a working group member and making other technical and stylistic amendments. Um, and I want, just want to be clear that this is a uh, um, work in progress as it goes forward. So just ask for everybody's consideration. So any discussion on this one? On these two, voting on SCR 55 and SR 50. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to amend, uh, to pass with amendments, uh, SCR 55 as well as SR 50. Uh, that's with amendments. Uh, with all five members present, any voting with reservations? Any no votes? Commissioner is adopted, Mr. Thank Chair. You. And finally, moving on to SCR 7. Sure. SCR 73 and SR 66 requesting uh, U.S. DOT to conduct an investigation regarding the safety of the bridges along Hana Highway. Um, recommendation on this one, I, I think um, uh, there's going to be efforts uh, going on outside of the need for a resolution. So at this time, we'll defer this, these two. And with that, we're going to adjourn our 3 p.m. And I'll just note for everyone who's following along as well, we still have our uh, joint agenda coming up and then one more DM agenda. So we'll adjourn the 3 p.m. Okay, hey, we're convening the committee on Senate Committee on Transportation here in Conference Room 224 for a decision making on HB 2336 HD2 relating to the photo red light imaging detector systems program. This was a measure previously heard, um, which we had deferred to this agenda. So we'd like to move this measure forward, uh, making a couple amendments. Um, the first was uh, adding language, which would add a minimum yellow light time at any intersection in which the program operates, in which a uh, uh, photo red light imaging detector systems uh, program is operating and a broader three second minimum yellow light time uh, just generally into HRS. And so we worked with DOT to try and figure this out over the last couple of days. So mahalo to them. So any discussion on this measure? If not, Vice Chair. Okay, Chair's recommendation on HB 2336 House Draft 2 to pass with amendments with five members present. Any with reservations? Any no votes? Oh, I'm sorry, I need to correct myself. With four members present, any with reservations, any opposition? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of our 3 p.m. Uh, again, for folks who are watching, we will be shortly going into a joint committee hearing with the GBO committee. So for now, we are uh, in recess. Good afternoon. We're convening our joint committee, uh, Committees on Transportation and Government Operations here in Senate Conference Room 224, as well as online. We do have four measures up this afternoon, uh, beginning with HB 1412 HD2 relating to abandoned vehicles, which requires the counties to provide minimum distance a vehicle must be moved within a specified time frame after a vehicle is initially inspected for abandonment and makes other amendments. And testifying first on 1412 is the County of Maui Department of Environmental Management. And support, oh, it actually looks like we have support testimony from everybody, which includes County of Maui, County of Hawaii, Department of Environmental Management, Hawaii Council of Mayors, Hawaii State Association of Counties, Maui MPO, and about eight individuals. Um, that is all the testimony we have, seeing as there's no one to ask questions of. Why don't we move on to the next measure, which is HB 1413 relating to abandoned vehicles, which allows the director of finance of a county to require payment of outstanding charges and fines relating to the disposition of an abandoned vehicle within the county. Um, and makes other 
other amendments. And testifying first on 1413, uh, similar to the last bill, all testimonies in support, including the County of Maui Department of Environmental Management, uh, Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management, County of Kauai, Department of Finance, Hawaii Council of Mayors, Hawaii State Association of Counties, Maui MPO, and about 10 individuals. Uh, again, there's no one um, here testifying in person, so we have no one to ask questions of. So that being said, why don't we move on to the next measure on the agenda, which is HB 1686 HD1 relating to digital identification, which requires the Director of Transportation to establish and implement a digital ID program. I'm testifying first on 1686 is the Department of Transportation. Good afternoon. Chair Lee, Vice Chair Inouye, Chair Moriaki, Chair Delacruz, members of the committees, the Department of Transportation is in support of the measure and in the interest of time, we would like to stand on our written testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, up next is Office of Enterprise Technology Services. Good afternoon. Aloha, we'll stand on our testimony in support of the bill. Thank you. Uh, we also have testimony from Hawaii Tourism Authority. And I believe that is all the testimony we have. Are there any questions? Uh, if not, just real quick for uh, DOT. You're still with us? Um, sure. In the Senate measure, the, the I think it might be the companion measure which moved out of the Senate. Um, there was a note made, and it was made in some testimony here as well, that real ID is being evaluated, or excuse me, digital ID is being evaluated by uh, the federal government for use as real ID, but that has not yet been resolved. Is that is that right? Well, um, uh, I'll have to defer to one of our staff persons who might be on the call. call. Lee, can you... Uh, handle that? Um, yes, good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Um, that is correct. It is it is still under evaluation um, and rules have not been made by the federal government to implement this program. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, any further questions on this measure? If not, thank you everybody. Let's move on to the last measure on our agenda, HB 1688 HD1 relating to the registration of vehicles which subjects you drive motor vehicles to the same motor vehicle uh, registration fees as other motor vehicles. And testifying first on 1688, is the County of Kauai, Mayor Dark Kawakami in support. Um, we also have supportive testimony from um, County of Kauai Managing Director, County of Kauai Department of Finance, Hawaii State Association of Counties. And I believe joining us uh, testifying today is the Tax Foundation. Not present, Chair. Okay, thank you with comments. Uh, Maui MPO in support, Hertz in support, Enterprise, Good afternoon. You win the uh, special award for the day for being the first person to testify in person. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, know. and it's really nice to see you all in person. <laughs> hey, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mihoko Ito uh, on behalf of Enterprise. Uh, we are in support of this measure. And just briefly, uh, this is a collaborative effort between the rental car industry and several of the counties um, uh, who have gotten together to try to address some of the impacts of um, tourism traffic congestion. Um, so we would just ask you respectfully to move the measure. We're in strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Maui Chamber of Commerce with comments and uh, support testimony from two individuals with one opposed. And that's all the testimony we have. Are there any questions on this measure? All right. If not, that is the last measure on our 315 agenda. Uh, while we wait for quorum, why don't we recess? Uh, good afternoon. We're reconvening the committees on transportation and government operations for decision making on our joint 3.15 p.m. agenda. Up first is HB 1412 HD2 relating to abandoned vehicles. Seeing all testimony and support recommendation, it's going to be uh, having consulted with our, our co-chair to pass as is. Any discussion? 
Not Vice Chair. Okay, Chair's recommendation on the Committee on Transportation on HB 1412 House Draft 2 is to pass unamended. Chair Lee. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Decoy. Aye. Senator Shimabukuro. Aye. Senator Favela is excused. The measure is adopted. Thank you. Okay, for uh, Committee on Government Operations, same recommendation. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair De La Cruz. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Chang, aye. Senator Gabbard excused, Senator Favela excused, recommendation adopted. Thank you. Moving on to HB 1413 HD2 relating to abandoned vehicles. Again, seeing all testimony and support recommendations to move as is. Any discussion? If not, Vice Chair. Okay. Uh, thank thank you. you. Chair's recommendation on HB 1413 House Draft 2 for the Committee on Transportation is to pass on amended with five members present. Any voting with reservations? Any no votes? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. For Government Operations Committee uh, for House Bill 1413, same recommendation. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair De La Cruz. Okay, with four members present, one excuse. Any reservations, objections, recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you. Moving on to HB 1686 HD1 relating to digital identification. Um, recommendation is to move this forward, making just one amendment, adopting the ETS amendments, which remove the statutory prohibition on digital ID being used as a real ID, as it is currently being evaluated by uh, federal government and Homeland Security. And this reflects the Senate bill, which we earlier passed out of the Senate. Any discussion on this? If not, okay. Vice Chair. Okay, the Committee on Transportation Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1687 House Draft 1 with amendments with all mem five members present. Any res with reservations, any no votes? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. For a Government Operations Committee, same recommendation. Uh, Chair votes aye. Vice Chair De La Cruz. Okay, wait, four members present, one excuse. Any objections, reservations, recommendation adopted? Thank you. Moving on lastly to HB 1688 HD1 relating to registration of vehicles. Uh, recommendation on this one is to move as is. Any discussion? If not, Vice Chair. Okay. Committee on Transportation Chair's recommendation to pass HB 1688 House Draft 1 unamended. Five members present. Any voting with reservations? Any no votes? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And that uh, is, oh, wait, oh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, committee, uh, government, government Operations Committee, same recommendation. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Adela, please. Okay, with four members present, one excuse, any objections, reservations, recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. Okay.